The highly popular Cessna 152 was first delivered in 1977, and a total of 7,584 were built over its short eight-year production run. The airplane provided seating for two people and was targeted at the training and private ownership market. It was a development of the Cessna 150, which was one of the most successful aircraft programs of all time, with almost 24,000 being produced between 1959 and 1977, when the 152 took over the Wichita, Kansas line. The 152 was more powerful than the Cessna 150, was more compatible with the newly introduced 100 LL low lead fuel, offered a greater useful load, and was designed to be more quiet both internally and externally. Over the years, the aircraft was produced in several versions, offering varying degrees of improvements. For more than 30 years, the Cessna 152 has proven to be an excellent airplane to teach just about anyone the skills required to develop into a good pilot. This aircraft is generally the first one that a student is introduced to since it has docile handling characteristics and offers reliable yet basic flight instrumentation and aircraft systems. The 152 is an excellent hour building aircraft for a new pilot's initial post-solo training period because it offers excellent affordability and value. The aircraft also proves a good first step before moving on to the larger and higher performance Cessna 172 Skyhawk, since these airplanes are very similar. You are about to experience what it's like to fly the Cessna 152 as we undertake a training flight in the experienced and capable hands of Arna Kruton. Arna is the president, CEO, and chief pilot of Florida Flight Training Center, operating out of beautiful Venice Municipal Airport in Florida. Arna's logbook includes everything from gliders in his early years to heavy multi-engine commercial jets, and his passion for aviation and flight training are obvious to all those that know him. In the training seat today is Sorab Manga, an FFTC student with lofty goals of flying commercially in the near future. He has previously logged several hours in the Cessna 152 and is fast approaching his first solo flight as soon as he proves to Arna that he has the aptitude and ability to handle the aircraft safely on his own. The aircraft that our pilots will be operating today is a Cessna 152 that first flew in 1978 carries the registration November 463 Tango Charlie. It is fitted with a 110 horsepower Lycoming flat Ford engine that allows the airplane a maximum takeoff weight of 1,670 pounds. Its maximum cruising speed is 110 knots, but a more typical speed would be between 100 and 105 knots. Arna and Sorab will put three Tango Charlie through its paces and introduce you to some of the basic skills and knowledge that are required before the instructor can leave the student alone for his first flight. Venice Airport was built in the 1940s as a military training base during World War II and after the conflict became a civilian airfield. The airport boasts an ideal location right on the Gulf of Mexico and is bordered by a wildlife preserve, a golf course, and Florida's famous white sandy beaches. It is about 20 miles from Sarasota Airport to the north and 50 miles to Fort Myers Airport to the south. This offers student pilots local uncongested training airspace as well as controlled airspace just a short flight away to help develop radio communications and instrument approach skills. The airport has two 5,000-foot crossed runways offering four distinct approaches. They are runway 1331 and runway 422, each measuring 150 feet wide. There are over 230 aircraft based at the airport and annual movements vary between 165,000 to 175,000 per year, which averages over 450 per day. Air Utopia welcomes you on board for a personal flight training experience to witness our student pilot's initial progress as he tries to prove to his instructor that he's ready to make his first solo flight in the Cessna 152. We 
are just before the solo now. Uh, yesterday we did all the maneuvers and uh, they were up to standards. Today we are going to review some of these maneuvers again and make sure you are consistent. Part of the, the drill will be uh, the normal takeoff, climbing out uh, to 2,000, 2,500 feet, depending on the cloud layer. We are going to the practice area. And then once we get to the practice area, we will start with the slow flight or the minimum controllable airspeed. And out of the minimum controllable airspeed configuration, we will initiate the power off stall. You will fully recover, then we will do some more clearing turns and do some steep turns, both to the left side and the right side. And then after that, we will come back to the field. You will show me a proper entry into the downwind, proper uh, communication procedures and a uh, short field landing. Okay. We've discussed and practiced the short field already. If everything goes uh, as planned and you are consistent uh, again, then um, sometime in the later on in the afternoon or perhaps tomorrow, I will get out of the airplane and you're going to fly this airplane by yourself. Beautiful. All right. Talk briefly then about uh, the procedures. We do our normal climb out to what altitude again? 300 feet below traffic right now, too, so that will be 700 feet. 700 feet. Okay, so somewhere at 700 feet, you're going to make what kind of a turn? Take off, and if you clear obstacles, then you turn depending on the 45 degrees or straight out. Okay, so we're going to you have a choice you can go straight out and climb to as high as uh, perhaps 1,500 feet. Okay. You now know that you are above the traffic pattern altitude, so you will not have conflict anymore with other airplanes that are in, you know, in the traffic pattern. And then from there, you can uh, choose the heading necessary to get to the practice area. As we get to the practice area, we're going to do our normal uh, clearing turns, like we said, um, and then we start the uh, slow flight. Uh, we start, of course, again, you know, with the reduction of power. And today, the uh, performance of the aircraft is not very good. Uh, what is the uh, performance uh, based on, again? The weight of the airplane, uh, temperature and pressure of the atmosphere outside. Okay. Uh, now, the weight has been the same during these fi first 15 hours because we've been flying together. The temperature is very high today. We have high humidity. Uh, the pressure is uh, just below standard, uh, but the temperature is is a, a big performance uh, determining factor today. So, um, like we discussed yesterday, uh, when you reduce the power and you configure the aircraft, expect the need of quite a, quite a bit of power thereafter to maintain your altitude. Yes. Uh, it's possible that we might at some point even need almost full power okay. to maintain the altitude, okay? okay? You're going to maintain directional control and keep looking outside for the traffic. And, uh, and when you start adding all this extra power, what do we need to, what can we expect or what do we need to watch for? Well, you look for the left turning tendency of the airplane. Okay, remember left turning tendencies are the strongest with a high angle of attack, a slow speed, correct, and high power yeah, setting. Okay. okay, these th three things. What are the left? Uh, what are the left turning tendencies again? We have torque, torque, uh, p factor, p factor, gyroscopic precession, precession, and spiraling slipstream. Very good. The slipstream. Okay, so these four left turning tendencies, they become extra strong now while we are here at a high angle of attack at slow speed after you start adding power again. Okay, very good. So what are we going to do to prevent the airplane from turning left? You counter by using the right rudder. That's right, so we're gonna use the right rudder. Remember, we make shallow turns in a configuration like that. Do you remember why we make shallow turns? And because steep turn? and during turning, the stalling speed increases, so the chances that we bring to a stall. Because we're so slow, the stall speed, uh, we're in close right. to the stall speed, yes, uh, it would increase and uh, 
and we don't want to stall the aircraft, we're not going to recover from the slow flight. Instead, what we will do to save time, like we have been doing, uh, we're going to put the aircraft in an arrival or a, a descent attitude, after which we're going to reduce the power and initiate the stall, okay? You will then recover, okay? And what, what is the procedure again for recovery? You put the nose down, increase power, and raise one notch of flaps. Very good. We raised one notch of flaps because the 30 degrees of flaps in a little Cessna 152 make more drag than lift. Yes. So, uh, and it's going, to, it's going to prevent us from gaining speed again. So we will raise the flaps 10 degrees immediately, then allow the airplane to accelerate and when we see that the airplane has a positive rate of climb, on which instrument do we see the positive rate of climb? The VSI. The VSI, very good. So when we see on the VSI that the airplane is climbing again, we then retract the flaps another 10 degrees uh, until we are clean, okay? Yeah. And then we make a power adjustment. And then uh, after we do some clearing turns again, we will do the steep turn. You know, you may trim the airplane or not. Um, that's up to you. Uh, also, if you want to add power, uh, that's fine with me. Um, but uh, of course, the objective is that we're going to make a nice 360 degree turn one time around at approximately 45, 50 degree bank with uh, little variations in bank during the turn. Yes. And you shall roll out after the 360 degree turn you shall, shall roll out on the same heading where, uh, where we started, plus minus 10 degrees. Okay, that's the standard. So after a left turn and a right turn, steep turn, we're gonna come back to the airport. We want to end up somewhere in a downwind position here and enter that at a 45 degree angle. Okay, and we want to come in about two, three miles out so we have time to slow down perhaps, uh, get to the right altitude. We want to be at pattern altitude here. And also we want to check for the other traffic and find out how we can get in between perhaps an, a trailing or a leading aircraft or an aircraft in front of us, right? Yes. Okay, so for proper separation, we're gonna go and fly to this imaginary point here. And that's gonna be a little bit more difficult because here we are over the Gulf of Mexico. So there is not really a lot of uh, things we can look for in the water that we can fly to. So we're gonna enter the downwind then. And because we're doing a short field uh, landing, uh, we are, we're, we have 5,000 feet, we're, uh, we're going to imagine that we have as little as uh, 1,500 or 2,000 feet. Um, somewhere here from the, mo from the moment that we start the descent, you will start configuring the aircraft with flaps sooner than normal, okay? So somewhere from here, and I leave that up to you, you know? We're going to still turn base about 45 degrees with the numbers and you're going to start configuring the aircraft sooner than you usually do. Uh, the other thing that we have practiced that you're going to do is fly an approach speed that is slightly slower than your normal approach speed. Okay, um, now the two things you're going to be looking for once you turn final is the proper glide path if you turn final and you see you're slightly fast, what are you going to do to slow the aircraft down quickly, slow it down to the slower airspeed that you want? You pitch up a little bit. Okay, you pitch up a little bit. Uh, now, when you do this and you pitch up a little bit, you notice that you're getting a little bit above the glide path. What should be your response? You reduce the power a little bit. You make a power adjustment, very good. Or you're getting slightly below the glide path, you look at your speed, your normal approach speed is what you want, it is the proper speed, you're getting below the glide path, what should be your response? You just add the power, add a little bit more power. Perfect. These are the things that we need to do to stay on the proper glide path and to fly the proper approach speed. Yes. Okay. 
Well, uh, that concludes our uh, pre-flight. It seems that you know what we're talking about. Uh, let's go downstairs and uh, check the weather one more time, pre-flight an airplane and go and do it. The flight school is about 22 miles south of Sarasota, Bradenton, between Sarasota and Fort Myers. So we have two airports right around us for good practices of control towers and approaches when you're doing an instrument flight. Looking over here on the shade of the colors, you have the return uh, intensity. You can see a few red spots over here, uh, which means that it's, it's really, really intense around this area. We definitely have thunderstorms, towering thunderstorms, maybe up to 40, 45,000 feet with heavy uh, icing and precipitation uh, and definitely a lot of turbulence. You can see uh, a cumulonimbus cloud going from probably about 3,000 to 45,000 in 45 minutes. The, the amount of damage that that can do to your airplane if you fly through that is unbelievable. The force of nature, the power of nature should not be messed around with to always check your weather even if it's a local flight. How do you want to do it? Is it, is it booked? Um, it is... Mm, is it booked? It's back until 5.30 so it's available for 5.30 I don't know how long that is. Municipal Airport Automated weather observation. One, three, five, five, Zulu weather. Wind, one, two, zero, at three. Visibility, one, zero, clear, below, one, two, thousand. Temperature, three, two, Celsius. Dew point, two, seven. Altimeter, three, zero, one, five. Remarks. Density altitude, one, thousand, seven, hundred. Venice Municipal Airport is in a noise-sensitive community. Runway 22 is a noise abatement and calm wind runway. The traffic pattern for runway 13 is right hand. Cabin inspection for today's flight on the 152 includes checking that the ignition is off, check. Documents in POH on board. We have the POH at the back of the airplane, so that's a check. We have our documents that are all the way back over here. We have a registration certificate, our airworthiness certificate. We have those. The control lock comes off. Check. As you can see, the, the control surfaces move freely. Master switch that comes on. Check. The flaps come down for the, pre the exterior airplane. We have about five gallons in each tank. That gives us about uh, an hour and a half of uh, flight time. Check, the cabin inspection is complete. Let's move on to the airframe inspection. Okay, so we did the cabin inspection. Check. We're going to the airframe inspection, starting with the empennage, rudder and gust lock removed. Now that's not a Cessna part. That's something that we made here in-house to prevent the rudder from going left and right in, uh, in he heavy winds. Okay, till, uh, till tie down removed. Very good, and then check the uh, control surfaces. Check, free movement, things in place. Left elevator check, free movement, no obstruction, core team to be in place, nuts and bolts in place, check. Check from the right elevator, nuts and bolts in place, hinges of the trim tab seem good. Try to move this here, make sure it's sturdy. Right. And then there's an AD on those brackets there that are green and you want to inspect that very carefully. Make sure there's no cracks in here and they are on the bottom, on top, on both sides. Alright, check. Okay. Alright, very good. Then we go to the right wing trailing edge. Check the tracks again. Connecting rod and the flap rails uh, with 
which are the tracks we check the ailerons, check the hinges, check which come from underneath, free movement, and make sure they're all connected. Hinges seem good. And when you stick your finger in there, always hold the aileron, okay? okay? So when the wind comes, your finger doesn't get clipped off. Okay, very good. Uh, that will be uh, the trailing. Now we go to the leading edge. Okay, remove wing tie down. And we check the main wheel. Check. Make sure there's no hydraulic leaks from the brake. This is the only thing that is hydraulic on this airplane, it's your brake, your brake system, okay? Check your brake pads, and the wheel itself, and the tire. Okay, okay right fuel drain, check quality and color. There's only one location on each wing where we check the fuel. Very good. Right fuel tank check quantity visual. Okay. Check. Right down. Okay. How much time do we have in that tank? We have about 54 minutes. 54 minutes. Okay, so going back to left fuel tank, we check for quantity visually. Five gallons, so about one hour of flight time in the uh, left fuel tank. And we go to the nose portion of the aircraft. We check the uh, oil level. I brought you a rag, so go ahead and check the oil level. We should have a minimum of four quarts and no more than six quarts. We have about five quarts. Five quarts, very well. Put the dipstick back. Don't tighten it too much. And we check for nicks. Okay, make sure there's no nicks. And not any corrosion on the propeller. And uh, what I always do when I'm here anyways, I check the alternator belt, even though it's not on the checklist. Check the alternator belt, the alternator bracket. Okay, that holds the alternator. And look inside here, make sure there's no bird's nest in here. And when you look on the other side, see the oil cooler. And we'll make sure that there's no debris or anything okay. obstructing. Because that, that would sense your oil temperature right up. Right. Okay. And then you just go from here to the landing light, to the uh, air filter. And then while we're down there, we can inspect the, uh, the entire nose gear. Make sure there's enough on the strut, on the oleo. Make sure the wheel and the tire is in good condition. Okay, everything is there. It needs to be there. And then uh, we go to the static port. Make sure the static port is clean, clear. You remember what that is for, the static port? For your uh, instruments, for your ambient pressure outside. That's right. So for the airspeed indicator, the altimeter, and the vertical speed indicator, yes. get their information from the static port. Very good. Okay, we're going to uh, drain the fuel. I'll bring it over here for a second so I can see it also. Let's look at that. That looks good. It's blue, it's clear. There's no debris in it. Let me put that back in the wing. Then the pitot tube, of course, here. Make sure there's nothing in there. You remember what this is for? For the airspeed indicator. Okay, that's the ram air. To, or to measure the ram air. Or dynamic air dynamic for the pressure. airspeed indicator. Very good. Can you get to this uh, stall warning horn? So we suck on that and it works fine. Okay, then the fuel tank vent. As long as there's no blockage, uh, we have a good vent. All right, then the left wing trailing edge. Let's go to the back of the wing. So we're first going to check the uh, flap rails or tracks here. 
make sure there's no excessive movement there and check also the uh, the rod that pushes the flap out check and pulls it back in okay and then we look at the aileron here move the aileron up and then check the connections the three hinges okay and well that will complete the airframe inspection then This instrument here is the airspeed indicator. Next to that we have the attitude indicator, we have the altimeter, the OBS or the Omni Bearing Selector, it's used for navigation purposes. That's our primary radio panel. The one on the left is the communications one with active and standby frequency and the one on the right is navigation radio which also has an active and standby frequency. Below that we have the transponder with a mode C capability or an altitude reporting capability. Some of the busier airspaces require the airplane to have this sort of a transponder for you to enter the airspace. It tells the controller on his radar screen what your altitude actually is. We have our tachometer for our engine. We have the ammeter. The red light comes on when the battery starts discharging, so it gives you an idea that there might be something wrong with the alternator. The suction gauge, which shows you if you have ample amount of suction for the operation of a few instruments that we'll talk about later. Moving down, we have the turn and slip coordinator and the inclinometer. We have the heading indicator, the vertical speed indicator, or the VSI. Here we have the Hobbs, or the Hobbs meter which basically tells us how much time the electrical system has been running for. The ELT, or the Emergency Locator Transmitter, comes on when the airplane suffers significant impact. It gives search and rescue teams an idea of your position since it transmits a signal on 121.5. We have the push to talk button on the flight controls on the left and the right. It's used when you want to make a radio call or when you want to transmit something or reply back to ATC. Moving down here behind the control column, you have your fuel gauges, which indicate the fuel in the left and the right tank. We have our oil temperature and pressure gauges. Down below you have the primer from the engine, which assists in easier starts. The master switch, which consists of two switches, the left controls the alternator and the right controls the battery. We have the ignition switch for the left and right magnetos and light switches as well as pitot heat, carburetor heat, which is basically used when the engine indication on the tachometer or the RPM goes out of the green arc. We have the throttle. The mixture control, other than being a push and pull knob, also can be rotated. You can change it in small increments that's helpful when you're changing or leaning the mixture in flight the elevator trim wheel. We have our set of fuses for all the electrical instruments and lights. The plate here that you can see behind the controls are flap position indicator on the flap switches. Below the instrument panel you have the rudder pedals, two for each pilot. At the top of the pedals we have the brakes, the left actuating the left brake and the right actuating the right brake. You can press one brake at a time to activate differential brakes, which is usually used during turning, or if you want to slow down or get the airplane to a complete stop, push the pedals together. There are two basic principles of operation of instruments on this airplane, one of them being the pedostatic instruments, which include the airspeed indicator, the altimeter, and the vertical speed indicator. The other being gyroscopic instruments, which include the attitude indicator, the turn and slip coordinator, and the heading indicator. In order for the gyroscopic instruments to work properly, the casing needs to be in a vacuum. For this reason, we have a vacuum pump, which gives sufficient amount of suction to keep these instruments working properly. The suction gauge tells us if we have enough suction required for the proper functioning of these instruments. Before starting engine checklist, uh, departure briefing, 
Well, we got that storm here to the east, so we're going to stay west, okay. northwest of the storm. Uh, it is moving, slightly moving east, southeast, okay? So it's not gonna get us in trouble. Uh, we're going to do uh, some local flying, stay to the northwest. Okay. And keep an eye on that storm. If the storm does move west or towards the airport, we're gonna quickly come back and land. All right. Um, anything unusual happening, seriously affecting safety of flight, we also come back to the airport, of course. Okay. Uh, we're going to do a normal takeoff and then uh, find an area where we're going to do the slow flight stall series, steep All turns. Right. And then uh, come back and do a short field landing. Okay. Okay, to runway uh, one three. Any questions on that briefing? Not at all. Okay. Uh, then we'll go from there. All okay. Right. But we're not going to, of course, we're not going to do anything that jeopardizes the safety of this flight. Of course. So the uh, pre-flight inspection is complete. The uh, cabin door. Let's close them uh, on both sides. Open the window for fresh air. Very good. Okay, the brakes are set. The uh, fuel valve is uh, on. on, the circuit breakers are all in, Check. avionics off. are off. Very good, mixture is coming rich, Check. the throttle is open a quarter inch, Check. carburetor heat off. is off, Check. beacon is on. Check. Okay, primer is in a lock, did we prime yet? No let's, let's prime her a couple times, maybe three times, for an easier start. Okay, master switch on, and then uh, the before starting engine checklist is complete. So go ahead and uh, start Side the next. engine. Clear prop! Part of the after engine start checklist includes putting the flaps up for takeoff. In a normal takeoff, we don't usually use flaps. I set the power to 1000 RPM after the engine start. It allows the engine to heat up a bit. We do a procedure what's known as a brake check. It includes just after you start taxiing, you apply full pressure on the brakes and make sure that the airplane comes to complete halt. It's fairly easy to taxi the Cessna 152. The recommended speed for a taxi is anywhere between 800 to 1000 RPM, depending on the weight of the course. The thunderstorm was actually moving southeast, which was definitely away from where we were going, so it really wasn't a factor for today's flight. It's called a wind correction. Since the Cessna 152 is a high wind airplane, wind can affect your taxing. To make sure that it doesn't affect the airplane, you put the ailerons in a particular configuration depending from where the wind is coming from.
monitoring the weather, I set my altimeter. Before every departure or takeoff, it's standard to do what's called a pre-takeoff checklist. It includes me doing the engine run-up. I add power to 1800 RPM and then I check the left and the right magnetos. There shouldn't be a drop of more than 125 RPM for each engine and definitely not more than a difference of about 50 to 70 RPM between each indication. I'm looking at the tag to see those readings. I find the engine running a bit rough because of carbon deposits on the spark plug. It's fairly simple to clean the spark plug by just adding power and letting the engine run to about 2100 RPM for about a minute. I'm also checking the carburetor heat. I know that it's functioning properly when I see a slight drop in the engine at the end. Arna points out that we have enough suction for the instruments to work properly. I also put the transponder on and now I'm doing a control check. Left, right, aileron movement as well as the elevator and the rudder. I'm making sure that there's no obstructions and the controls are moving smoothly. Once I'm satisfied with the before takeoff checklist, I make sure that our seat belts are on, the doors are closed, and the windows are shut. It's really important to make sure that you're looking out for traffic all the time. I've made sure that there's no traffic by looking at the approach and departure end of the runway. Once I'm lined up to the runway center line, I add power and hold the throttle. Sometimes the throttle does slip out because of vibrations from the engine, and I want maximum power on takeoff and climb. After takeoff, you see me moving the elevators. I'm correcting for the wind that's affecting my flight path. Aiming for about 67 knots, which is the best rate of climb speed in this airplane. Arna is now performing the after takeoff checklist. that the transponder is sending out signals of my position. about 700 feet and then 
exited the pattern at 45 degrees. After completing the traffic tap, I'm now established on the right base for runway 13. I've slowed down and once I'm in the safe lap operating range, I put the first launch of the house down. The flap setting for landing usually depends on the pilot. Here I've chosen 30 degrees of flaps. As I continue to slow down, I'll add another notch. I'm aiming for about 60 knots right now in approach. the last notch of flaps. I'm not ready to land the airplane. Just about 150 feet, I get a left crosswind. I start correcting by putting left aileron input. It's good that you hear the stall horn on landing, especially in the Cessna 152. You know that you are at the right airspeed. It's important for a student to understand that a safe landing is more important than a smooth landing. You can always learn how to land smooth, but first you should learn how to land the airplane safely. The procedure is the same, you see him holding the toddle in its place as well. And just as the airplane is ready to fly, he applies a little bit of elevator pressure and we're off into the air. You also see him using the controls to correct for the wind so that we maintain the same runway heading and track. That's me to look for traffic on the left, since we're going to be exiting the traffic pattern at a 45 degree angle again. It's important to listen for other traffic on the Unicom frequency in Venice. You get an idea of their position as well as their intentions, and it helps you plan your flight better.
safe flap operating range. He puts the flaps down. He's now descending at about 500 feet per minute and at 300 feet. You see him encountering the same left crosswind that I had while I was landing. We had some traffic on final for runway 13, so we waited for the traffic to clear from the runway. the airplane on the center line. He gives me the controls by what's known as positive exchange of controls. He'll tell me that you have the controls. I respond by saying my controls and he says your controls. I add power and make sure that I hold the throttle in its place. about 500 feet per minute and pitching for 67 knots or the best rate of climb in this airplane.
longest flight that I've done on a Cessna 152 is probably about five and a half hours. Of course, it included me stopping and refueling at my destination airport. It's a nice airplane to fly when you're flying straight and level. It stays there, it's stable. You don't have to work too much, you don't have to fight it too much. It's responsive to your inputs, to everything that you do to the airplane. It won't fight you. You are the pilot when you're flying the Cessna 152. We're at 1,000 feet right now, climbing to about 1,700 feet. That's the altitude that we've chosen for doing maneuvers today. Of course, the clouds being a factor. basically controls the amount of fuel going into the carburetor. From the ground up to about 3,000 feet, the mixture is full rich, but as you start going above 3,000, the air starts getting thinner or less dense. You start leaning the mixture slowly depending on the engine's tachometer. You don't want to over lean the mixture because it can cause the engine to overheat and can also cause the engine to quit. So it's really important to be confident about the way you lean the mixture with the airplane. I'm at 1,750 feet, setting up for cruise flight. what's called slow flight or flight of minimum control airspeed. I'm going to start by first slowing down to about 1800 RPM. I'm trimming since I want to maintain the same altitude and slow the airplane down. As I continue to slow down and I reach my flap operating speed or flap extension speed, I start lowering my flaps. I keep lowering my flaps until my airspeed comes down to the slowest controllable speed of this airplane. airspeed is the airspeed at which I still have the use of my flight control. I'm not going to demonstrate a power off stall or a stall in a landing configuration. As the airspeed slows down and I reach the critical angle of attack, the airplane stalls. I recover at the first.
first indication of the stall. I do that by pushing forward on the control yoke, adding power and turning the carburetor heat off at the same time, as well as putting one notch of flaps up. As I see a positive rate of climb, as well as an increase in airspeed, I retract the flaps in increments. I'm not going to be demonstrating steep turns, for which I got to make sure that I'm well clear of traffic or I've cleared the area. It's a part of my pre-maneuvering checklist. I'm first going to bank a bit to each side so I can look for any traffic. First begin the steep turn by doing one to the right. I do that by bagging the airplane at a 45 degree angle and looking outside for visual references as well as trying to look for traffic. I maintain the same altitude by making adjustments to my pitch. At such a steep bank, I do lose some vertical lift, so I add about 100 RPM. I start my rollout at about 20 degrees before my entry heading. I immediately turn and begin my steep turn to the left. I'm looking outside for visual references as well as traffic. Now that I've successfully demonstrated the maneuvers, we're now going to return back to the airport for a short field landing. Trimming the airplane allows me to concentrate on things outside. Part of the design and approach checklist is checking the weather again. That's why I'm going to tune into the AWOS frequency to listen to the weather. The last minute change in runway meant that I had to climb back to 1,500 feet and change my approach into the airport. I've just 
overflow the airport and I'm going to fly straight out for about two minutes until I can begin my procedure to turn back to join the Dominion for the runway in which we're landing, which is going to be runway 31. about 1800 rpm and use the car beat and begin my descending turn to enter the right downwind at 45 degree angle the standard procedure for entering a downwind I'm now at traffic pattern altitude, which is 1,000 feet above ground level for the airport. I'm also at a 45 degree entry into the left down for runway 13. As I reach about midfield, I'm going to start turning a bit to the right to be established on the downwind for runway 31. At 1,000 feet, I start adjusting for the traffic pattern airspeed again, which is a little slower than cruise airspeed, about 9 knots. Once I'm beating the numbers, I'm going to slow down again to about 1800 RPM and turn on the carb heat, begin my descent, and start turning base. I'm demonstrating a short field landing now. It involves me coming at a slower than actual approach speed of about 55 knots. about 200 feet before the runway, which is about 50 feet high. In the moment I'm clear of the obstacle and I make the call out, I go power idle, I pitch the nose down so I gain a little bit of airspeed. And I pitch up to make the landing. I try to land as soon as possible because I'm also simulating that the runway is really short. The moment I touch down, I put the flaps up. This way, I dump the entire weight of the airplane onto the wheels. The 
Cessna 152 is a really strong airplane, so it can really handle the stresses that you put on it. So even if you do make a couple of hard landings, don't be disheartened. That's what this airplane is built for. It's built for flight training. It knows that you're just learning how to fly. The airplane will give you time to learn and definitely has the aerodynamics and the performance to let you know how to fly an airplane. You can see Arna reading out the after landing checklist. The after landing checklist includes putting the landing light off, putting the car key off, and putting the transponder on standby and making sure that the elevator trim is set in the takeoff position again. Once you've completed the checklist and we've announced that you're clear of the runway in Paris, you can continue taxiing on to park our airplane. The airplane is slow to fly, it's, it will give you a good rate of climb. If you're flying solo, it could be anywhere from 7 to 800 feet per minute. And if you're flying with your instructor, it could be anywhere from 500 to 600 feet per minute, which for the airplane isn't bad, it's pretty good. So overall, flying the airplane is really nice. An average for a student to solo can go anywhere from 10 hours to 25 hours to some students who I know personally who have gone to 45 hours and still haven't solo. It depends on the confidence of the instructor and the confidence of the student. Some of the things that you want to look out while you're choosing a flight school, you want to make sure that you know the instructor to student ratio. When an instructor has a few students, he is able to give you more personalized attention. Things like financials are, of course, always there. Having contractual training probably helps you out because it gives you an idea of how much you will actually end up spending for your training, depending on the course that you've chosen. While you're looking for a flight school and once you see their prices, one thing for you to remember is that it's not always about the money, but it's about the quality of training that you get. You should actually consider spending more if you know that the quality of training that you're getting is much better. So it's more important to look for quality more than the price of the school. You can see on our right the two Cessna 172s, as well as one of the two Piper Senecas. We also have the Mooney in front of us, which is also a part of the flying school. The engine shutdown includes making sure that all the avionics are off. He puts the radios off and the transponder off and pulls the mixture lean. As the engine comes to a stop, I put the magnetos off and put the key up to signify that the engine magnetos have been shut off. Okay, that was an uh, excellent flight. Uh, I really don't have uh, much uh, to debrief you on, uh, or the critique is going to be very short today. You know the couple of little things that we can still improve on, uh, use a little bit more power a little bit sooner on the slow flight. Uh, you can always reduce the power a little bit again if you yeah. see that, if the trend is that we're going to climb. Uh, but there is no reason to get below the initial altitude that we start the maneuver at. Okay. But you were well within standards. Okay. All right. um, the stall was perfect, the recovery was really good, um, the steep turns were good. Coming back to the airport uh, looked good. The short field, remember that if you want to use an obstacle uh, in a training environment, brief where your obstacle is and how high that obstacle is going okay. to be. The next time you fly with somebody else, 
they don't know you, they don't know what your plan is unless you tell them. Okay. Okay? Make sure the briefing starts coming from you also in the future. Okay. I know you're ready to solve. So let's do the paperwork. Okay. Uh, I have to uh, endorse your logbook saying that you have received the knowledge and the flight training and that you are competent. I have to endorse your student pilot certificate and uh, we already did the pre-solo written test. I have that, it's graded. It was a formidable uh, test. You did really good, you scored high. Um, so uh, what we will do tomorrow is we will fly together, do three landings, and then if you're consistent with those three landings, I will get out of the airplane, okay? All right, All right. good job. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Arne Krutov. I'm the owner of the Florida Flight Training Center. Uh, the Florida Flight Training Center is in Venice, Florida, and I started this flight school in 1992. I flew everything from little Cessnas to King Airs and DC-8s around the world. Today, uh, I have uh, almost 12,000 hours of flight time. A lot of times people ask me what it takes to become a pilot. I would recommend go to the nearest flight school and find out. Most flight schools around the country, around the world, have competent people that can talk to you and tell you about all the advantages that aviation brings. So go out to the nearest flight school and find out for yourself. Once you think you have chosen that you want to become a pilot, um, let's first uh, think about where we should go, which country, uh, which area to pick a flight school. I think the most important thing is to look at the uh, quality of the flight training at that school itself. Secondarily, I think the infrastructure is very important and the availability of the material and the quality of the teaching itself. If your choice is to become an airline pilot, it is important to find a school that maintains airline standards. A big mistake that people make uh, once they start looking for a flight school is they choose the cheapest flight school or the school that offers cheap flight training. The problem with this is that flight training is not cheap. The Afgas or the fuel that we use for our aircraft and the whole support and infrastructure in and around the school these are expensive things. To maintain quality, to maintain high standards, this costs a certain amount. People in this industry that are trying to bring in students to their flight school by offering not realistic prices for their aircraft and training are not the schools I would recommend. To put this a little bit more in perspective, uh, let's assume you have the choice between two schools and the school you like better cost, has a training cost that is $10,000 higher than the other school that you don't like so much. $10,000 is two weeks or three weeks salary by the time you become a captain and can quickly be earned back once we are professionals. A school with poor airplanes that have poor maintenance, bad teachers or a poor infrastructure perhaps has bad meteorological conditions for a big portion of the year will cost in time so much more than these ten thousand dollars that the choice should be to go for the school that is maybe a little bit more expensive but will make you smile and happy every day you come to flight school and will actually give you a good chance to go into this industry be able to earn your salary without too many frustrations. The typical course here at the school would be somewhere between six and eight months. This will take you from the private through the instrument through the commercial level. Of course, one would have to do other things after that to be able to get a first job with an airline. 
but typically after a year and a half perhaps with a flight instructor rate and teaching for some four or five hours a day uh, this person would become eligible and we be, would have a potential chance to get hired by a commuter or a major airline which means within a year and a half this person could start earning money executing the profession, the job that they dreamt of when they were younger. Uh, another piece of advice to all of you out there, uh, if your choice or your dream is to become an airline pilot, don't let the economy or the market discourage you from going to flight school. The typical aviation cycle is six to seven years where lots and lots of pilots are needed and then less pilots are needed. But the population is growing rapidly. Aviation is still the most popular and becoming more and more popular way to travel. Therefore, pilots will be needed and pilot shortages will become an acute problem again in the near future. If you're thinking about learning how to fly in the United States, these are some of the beautiful things in this country. We have an incredible infrastructure. Every town, every village in this country has its own runways, its own airports where we can fly and airports that we can use daytime and nighttime. These airports at nighttime have lights that we can activate while being in the air without paying anything extra. Landings, we can make as many as we like, as many as we think are necessary to become good pilots at no additional cost. In the United States, we don't pay for the service of airways, the use of airways. In the United States, we don't pay additional money for practicing an instrument landing procedure. This is the only country where services are for the pilots and the whole system is designed and developed to support pilots. This is beautiful, this is unique. Add to that the beautiful country itself with its beautiful weather in most of the country. And I think America is an excellent choice to learn how to fly. As a recommendation to the parents of all those youngsters out there, that are dreaming about becoming a pilot, that maybe are afraid to talk to you and tell you that they want to become a pilot. Please don't discourage them. Please allow them to go to the nearest flight school, to the nearest airport, and let them try to fly an airplane. And if this puts a great smile on their face, and if you see that there is this dream, find out the possibilities and what it will take so your son, your daughter can become a pilot. Um, often I get young people contact me who wear glasses, who are maybe overweight, short, uh, tall, or maybe feel that they are not uh, made for this profession. Uh, what we need to remember is in aviation and in the pilot world, we look for stable, reliable and loyal people who don't make mistakes once they're sitting in the cockpit of an aircraft but for this you don't need to be a superman so every average person coming out of school has a fair chance to fulfill this dream